Buckle in, sports fans. You're listening to The William Haynes Show. The program will be starting in just a couple of minutes, so grab your popcorn and get ready to enjoy the show. While you're waiting, make sure you're following us on social media at WHBC Stream and staying tuned to WHBCStream.com. We're so glad to have you today on the program and we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on Twitter or call the show 352-639-0036. And thanks again for tuning in. HBC. Well, it is a very good evening to you and how you be. William Haynes here, you there, here at 1109 here on this Thursday night on the William Haynes Show. Of course, as always, live from the WHBC studio in Tallahassee, Florida. It seems like I say this about once a week, but now I think truly, depending on what the Lightning do uh, here in the, in the coming minutes, potentially, the best William Haynes show that we have had thus far. The Rays sweep their doubleheader in Baltimore against the Orioles today and punch their ticket to the 2020 postseason. Uh, A huge congratulations to everyone involved with that team. Really a great day for Rays baseball. A little different than we're hoping, of course, with the COVID. Nothing is normal. Um, I I certainly miss, and I'm sure um, everyone that's listening to this program missed out on uh, the the post-game celebration in the locker room with the champagne and uh, the the reporters asking the questions, getting doused in champagne and beer. Um, So it's not quite the same. It was just a little bit of, you know, some cordial, just on-field post-game celebrations. But make no mistake, this is a huge accomplishment for the race, not just for, for this season, but really in franchise history. They clinch a playoff berth. In back-to-back seasons for only the second time in franchise history. If you recall, they won the division in 2010 and made the wild card on the final night of the season in 2011. So the Rays have repeated that feat again for just the tw- uh, the second time in their 22 years of being a franchise. They, I believe the magic number to win the division is now down to seven. The Rays win both games today, but the Yankees have won seven straight. So it looks like the Rays are going to have to continue their winning ways if they have any hopes of winning the American League East. And we know that that that's such a huge priority uh, for everyone involved, the management and Kevin Cash, uh, all the players and everyone in the front office, Eric Neander, and even up to the owner and Stu Sternberg. It's going to be a big deal if the Rays can beat out the Yankees after having an 8-2 and record against them in the regular season. That wouldn't really mean anything if they can't hang the banger, uh, hang the, the banner, excuse me. It is a banger if they can hang it, though, um, for the 2020 American League East um, champion. So before I go any further, um, I know more than more so than any other night. I'm sure you guys would love to call in and celebrate, and I would be much obliged to take those calls at eight seven seven five six six ten twenty with you. Maybe for about an hour or so, depending on the result of the Lightning game, and uh, we'll we'll push that off a little bit later because, of course, this is um, in in all. 
in all intents and purposes, really a Rays post game show. So we'll hit the Rays first. Um, but if the Ray, if the Lightning do win, they are about ten minutes into overtime. Um, of course, another overtime game. What is it for the Lightning? If they win tonight, they punch their ticket to the Stanley Cup Final to play the Stars. And if the Islanders win, that will force a Game Seven. So I think, in a lot of ways, um, really a must win game for both teams. Obviously, in in practice and in, you know, in, in physically for the Islanders, they have to win to continue. But I think the Lightning, uh, they don't want anything um, in a Game Seven against a team like the Islanders. You think back to 2018 when they had a three games to two lead over the Caps and they lose game six and then they get blanked in game seven. Um, I think those memories may start flooding back, but the, the Lightning can avoid all of that if they can just win. All it will take is one more goal. Um, uh, the last game, game um, it would be game five, also went to double overtime and the Islanders end up taking that one. So this is going to be a, a a hardly fought series, and it looks like right now the Tampa Bay Lightning have scored in overtime and punched their ticket to the Stanley Cup final. Perfect timing. We'll see who it was. I want to say it was Braden Point, but I can't confirm it getting one past the Islanders goalie Varlamov. So now turn this into a, a Lightning uh, celebration show as well. A lot of exciting things going on, and it was Anthony Sorelli, it looks like, number 71. Um, in the Lightning all-white uniform, uh, getting it past Varlamov again. So what an exciting time, really, to be a Tampa Bay sports fan. I've mentioned this time and time again, and what a good postseason also for Sorelli. He's come up huge in big moments. So, again, the Lightning win this series in six. So great that I got to call that live. That was pretty cool indeed. So if also you want to call and talk Lightning, we'll probably try and get the, the NHL correspondent Aaron on the phone. He He's uh, more of a Lightning fan than anyone else that I know. We'll probably try and get him on the horn if he's willing uh, but if you guys want to call and talk lightning, talk rays, even bucks, but you know more so the the, the first two, we'll take those calls at eight seven seven five six six ten twenty. Again, what a show on September the 17th of 2020. Uh, what a night this is turning out to be. In such a strange year, uh, 2020 has been uh, one of the few nights um, are, are going to be as good as this one uh, this year. Of course, as the Lightning go on to win the Cup, and depending on what the Rays do in the postseason and who knows with the Bucks, it, it could end up getting a little bit better. But as of right now, uh, one, of the, one of the better days of the year as the Lightning um, and Islanders meet at mid-ice to shake hands, as is tradition during the NHL postseason. And so the Lightning, again, win the series in six over the Islanders in overtime. A goal from Anthony Sorelli, I believe, assisted by Goodrow. They had um, opportunities time and time again um, in overtime and late in the third period. So they do finally cash in. And what a great feeling um, that is for the Lightning. So they'll go on to the Stanley Cup final. And again, as I led off the show... The Tampa Bay Rays will be headed to the postseason for the the second consecutive year. So I guess we'll kind of try and calm down off of all that. I'll, again, I'll give you the phone number to call one more time if you're interested. 877-566-1020. We'll start with game one first. The Rays collected wins number 32 and 33 of the year this season. But we'll start with game one. A disclaimer, I did watch game one. I did not watch game two. But but we'll give you the breakdown uh, nevertheless. Don't have the, 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 uh, the trademarked uh, notepad notes. Uh, but we can give it to you all the same. So it was three to one in game one. Blake Snell in the mound versus Kramer um, of the Orioles. One, uh, Dean Kramer, one of the pitchers that they picked up in that Manny Machado trade a couple of seasons ago. And it was a, an interesting lineup. We knew the Rays were going to mi- mix and match with a doubleheader, especially um, being so close to the postseason. You need to keep guys fresh, and that's really what they ended up doing. Um, uh, 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 they went three one four hits no errors they only allowed three hits to the Orioles so again seven innings a chance maybe for Blake Snell to go complete game shutout the Rays haven't had a, a pitcher go complete game since 2016 um, and Snell only throws 73 pitches in five and a third so uh, we'll get all we'll get to all that uh, when we talk about it the way that they lined up will give you uh, the defensive alignment first in the outfield from left to right it was Meadows in left who who uh, left with some sort of injury I want to say it was a hamstring or, or some sort of I, I don't know exactly so um, and they haven't really provided any updates on that if they have and uh, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable of it please call me in at 877-566-1020 and let me know but it was Meadow starting the game in left Kiermaier in center Brett Phillips in right and then the infield um, from third to first it was Wendell at third Adamas played shortstop at second base it was Brandon Lau and playing first base it was Nate Lowe um, it was Michael Perez doing the catching and D and the DH of Yoshi Sutsugo who has well led off for the first time in his major league career something that he did uh, quite frequently in the Japan League uh, but and they they messed with it a little bit 
in summer camp, Cash said uh, then that he didn't necessarily plan for it, but uh, Shitsugo gets that nod here today. Goes one for four, knocks in a run, no walks, no strikeouts. Uh, then it was Brandon Lau batting second, Willie Thomas third, Nate Lowe did the cleanup duties once again. Austin Meadows hit hit fifth, which was kind of strange. Wendell um, sixth, Kiermaier or uh, I'm sorry, Wendell fifth, Kiermaier sixth. Uh, Brett Phillips, 8th, and Michael Perez, ninth, And we look a little bit uh, closer into the stats. They go 0 for 3 with runners in scoring position. It was Perez, Phillips, and Tetsugo all recording out and a total of six men left on base. Uh, for Phillips, though, the seminal high school uh, alum that is pretty close to Tropicana Field, he collected his first hit as a Ray here today with a triple that scored a run. I'm um, in the early going, so that was that was good to see. Um, and the pitching line it was Blake Snell going five and a third, an earned run on only two hits. Did walk a man, four strikeouts, thir- uh, seventy three pitches, forty seven were for strikes. He faced eighteen batters and threw first pitch strike to fourteen of them. I'll probably mention this a couple of times for Snell. Um, efficiency is really his biggest issue. It seems like he goes on to the mound trying to strike out everyone he faces, and that results in a lot of non-competitive pitches, a lot of breaking balls in the dirt, uh, a lot of fastballs too high outside the zone. It's almost like he doesn't even want uh, opposing hitters uh, to make any contact off of him, but that's going to drive up your pitch count. He did only strike out four, but did get some pretty bad swings and misses. I think the the scouting report, especially in the postseason, is quite clear. You take, take, take on Snell and, and you know make him throw strikes. And that's the thing about Snell is, I mean, he can challenge you with his fastball. The 96 with the movement that it has in the zone is really hard to hit as well. So I don't understand... Uh, why he doesn't want to throw more strikes. He he talks about it, but it seems like uh, it's kind of been the same shtick for him. It was a no decision, although he did leave the game um, with a one uh lead, and Castillo comes in and blows it but gets the win. So um, we'll, do the, we'll do the play-by-play, inning-by-inning. Um, we will start, of course, obviously at the top of the first. Hitsugo led the game off with a single, so that was good. Uh, but then uh, Lau, Adamas, and Lowe all recorded outs. Bottom of the first... Um, of course, Blake Snell on. He strikes out. Alberto uh, gets Iglesias to ground out. Matt, Mount Castle hits a single for the first hit allowed and gets to second on a wild pitch, but then he gets Severino to ground out uh, to end the first inning, so they do get a runner in scoring position. Uh, top of the second, Meadows works a leadoff walk. Wendell grounds into a fielder's choice, um, so, so Meadows is thrown out at second, so Wendell is at first with one out. Kiermaier flies out, and then Brett Phillips, the two-out race continue. It was uh, a triple to deep right and allowed Wendell to score. Uh, Phillips was able to coast into third base as well for his first hit as a ray, and it knocked in a run. Um, so, so that was cool to see. And then Perez, with Phillips only 90 feet away, strikes out swinging. Uh, so the Rays uh, go head to the bottom of the second with a one nothing lead. Snell gets a 1-2-3, gets Nunez, Stewart, and Hayes. So he was rolling at that point. Top of the third, uh, not much going. It was a walk from Lau, but nothing else. Susugo lines out, Adama strikes out, and Nate Lowe flies out. It was the... Um, they call it the golden sombrero for for Willie Adamas. 0 for 4 with 4 strikeouts, but boy, did he come back in game 2. We'll save that for a little bit later. Bottom of the third, Margot comes into left field to replace Austin Meadows. Again, the entry uh, that I'm not exactly certain what it was. I think it was probably just just you know being cautious because there's no need to have him in the game. Uh, it's much more important to have him ready come playoff time. So in comes Margot. So, so you know, that's a, a good point, a, a good part of having that outfield depth is you're able to make those kind of moves. So Margot comes into left. Valeka singles. Velasquez lines out, and then uh, Snell gets the double play um, from Alberto. So it was just a single. It was the only threat uh, for the O's in the third. Top of the fourth, not much going. Um, Margot grounds out. Wendell flies out. And then it was a double for Kiermaier, so they do get another runner in scoring position. And it was Brett Phillips lining out to end things. Bottom of the fourth, Snell gets a 1-2-3, gets Iglesias, Mountcastle, and Severino. Uh, top of the fifth we go. Um, it was Brandon Lau working a two-out walk, and then Adamas strikes out swinging one of the four that he had um, a, a, in the first game of the doubleheader. Bottom of the fifth, Blake Snell gets another one, two, three. So he he uh, had a, a nice little streak there of, of men retired. Nunez, DJ Stewart, and Hayes all retired in the fifth inning with a one nothing lead. So that's good with, in a close game to have Snell make those big pitches and get those pretty big outs. 
top of the sixth it was a one out uh, walk for margot then uh, uh wendell grounding into another fielder's choice what is it the one of two that he had today and then kiermeyer flies out to end things so they, it's like i say all the time they get base runners seemingly in every inning and they're usually they're just not able to do much with it they end up scratching out three um in the first game and that ended up being enough Bottom of the sixth, this is where things got a little bit hairy. Snell on to start the sixth. Uh, walks Valeka, and then uh, Velazquez hits a, a sacrifice, um, a, a grounder that allows Valeka to advance to scoring position. So, and again, in a one uh lead, you know, you have you have the tying run and scoring position. And at that point, um, Snell had faced exactly 18 batters, which is the, which is the order two times through. So I think um, that might have been the, the game plan anyway. I think maybe they would have liked to have him go complete game uh, with the way the bullpen was a little bit um, taxed. They had, um, of course, Josh Fleming with the early exit, um, you know, in, in yesterday's game. So uh, they really needed some length. Uh, Gastia was the only other pitcher to come on. So ended up working out. I think if it was a bigger lead for the Rays, maybe even just two runs, uh, it would have been enough to keep Blake Snell on. If you recall last year um, in August, it was um, Ryan Yarbrough. The last time he recorded a major league win, um, it was um, before, I, I believe, his start a couple of days ago. Uh, he went eight and two-thirds against the Mariners, and once again, that was a one nothing lead, and they go to the pen and get the out, so that you know prevents him from getting the complete game shutout. So uh, we, we've seen he's kind of moved from Kevin Cash before. I thought maybe a little bit over-managing, but the bullpen ends up coming through. Uh, well, kind of, I guess. We'll, we'll go ahead. And uh, Castillo comes in and gets Alberto to ground out to first, which allows Valleca to advance um, to third base. Uh, Iglesias walks, so there's runners at the corners. And then Mountcastle hits a single, um, which ties the game at one. Uh, and then uh, Castillo gets Severino to ground out uh, to third to end things. And uh, in the final inning, uh, in the top of the seventh, um, it was um, a Rosarena hitting for Phillips. Um, a Rosarena gets a leadoff walk. Perez, Michael Perez coming through once again. Uh, big, big, big game Mike, I guess is what we'll call him. Mikey Perez comes through with a double. So it's runners at second and third with nobody out. Again, in the top of the seventh, you know, a run would give you, uh, you know, a hit would give you a two run lead. And uh, instead, they, they go the small ball route. It's Yoshi Tetsugo with a ground out to score a Rosarena from third. Perez moves up to third base. Uh, and then Brandon Lau hits a sacrifice fly to left, which allows Perez to score. So as good of uh, as good as a hit, they take the 3-1 lead. Uh, Adamas uh, with the bases empty strikes out to end the side. And then bottom of the seventh to close things out, uh, Aurora Serena moves over to right field. Uh, Castillo comes in, gets Nunez to strike out, does walk DJ Stewart, uh, gets Hayes to line out. So there's out number two. Uh, they pinch it, uh, Rio Ruiz. He walks. So all of a sudden, you, you get a couple of men on. Um, and then it was Cisco uh, in a pinch hit situation, grounding into a fielder's choice to end things. So the race, uh, you know, they had the one nothing lead through. Snell gets pulled early, um, and then Castillo, uh, an, an unearned run, albeit, but ends up kind of blowing things, uh, I guess you could say. Uh, but then the offense comes through, um, you know, a really big hit for Michael Perez that set it all up and then playing some small ball with the sacrifice to bring in the, the two runs there in the seventh uh, for the 3-1 um, win. It was Castillo getting the win. He's 3-0, and uh, an inning and two-thirds, no earned runs on just a hit, but does walk three. I don't love that, a strikeout, and a lot of pitches for him too, which I'm, I'm not huge on, 34 pitches, 17 for strikes. He does have an ERA under two. It sits at 186 right now. Uh, he faced nine batters and threw a first pitch strike to six of them. So he did a pretty decent job uh, of getting in front of in front of guys. But just, you know, the 34 pitches is going to keep him out, you would think, for a couple of days, which would be, I believe, the rest of this Baltimore series, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we look ahead now um, to the Rays' schedule, and uh, there is going to be an afternoon game on Sunday. So um, I would imagine Castillo would not come back until then. They have The Rays have glass now tomorrow Morton on Saturday, so it looks like they're going to need probably um, uh, some length from the pen, uh, depending on how far Morton goes. I believe he threw about 75 pitches or so his last time out, but we'll preview that game on Friday night show. Um, so, so all in all for the Rays in, in game one of the doubleheader, not mad, not bad indeed. 3 1 win. Um, you know, seeing them come up big in big moments, uh, especially offensively, is good to see w- with how much they've kind of struggled. In that department, again, they go 0 for 3 with runners in scoring position and leave six men on, but ultimately it was enough to get the job done. Um, you know, 
standouts, it doesn't end up mattering really after game two, but Adamas goes 0 for 4 with the four strikeouts the Golden Sombrero awarded to him. Nate Lowe, who hits cleanup, goes 0 for 3 with a couple of strikeouts. Uh, Meadows with the early exit, and then that's really about it. Michael Perez, who hit ninth, had that really big double in the seventh, and then Phillips again collecting his first hit as a right and driving in the first run of the contest. So uh, I think that's a good a good point to leave it for a commercial break at 11:27. We're going to give you uh, the baseball scores that are going on right now. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking game two with a doubleheader. Of course, we'll kind of discuss you know the Rays uh, clinching the postseason. Uh, that's certainly exciting, and also the the Lightning. Uh, Uh, We called it on the air, punching their ticket to the Stanley Cup final against the Dallas Stars. So a lot to discuss, and we would love to have some of you listening at home to join in on that conversation. The number to call to do so, we do have a line open for you if you're interested, is 877-566-1020 at WHBC Stream is the Twitter. You can reach us there as well. So we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. HBC. Uh, a handful of games in MLB that have already gone final. The Astros 2-1 to one over the Rangers as they try to hold on for the second place um, in the American League West. The Indians finally get off the schneid with a 10-3 win over the Tigers. Shane Bieber gets his eighth win of the season. He is 8-1. Uh, the Pirates 5-1 to one over the Cardinals who are reeling. Uh, the Mets 10, Philly 6. The Yankees, they have won seven straight, 10-7 over the Blue Jays. Um, also final, the Giants 6-4 to four over the the Mariners, the Angels 7, Diamondbacks 3, the White Sox 4-3 to three over the Twins. They clinched a postseason spot and have the best record currently in the American League. The Boston Red Sox 5-3 to three over the Marlins. And the only game currently in action in the bottom of the 8th, the already clinched postseason Dodgers 9-2 to two over the Rockies. Number to call during the break is 877-566-1020. We'll be right back. Hey sports fans, William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember, you can call us at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway... When all that's said and done, please stay tuned for William's World Famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit whbcstream.com and thanks again for listening in. HBC and at 10:30 we are back on the William Hain show. I'll give you the number to call once more 877-566-1020. We'd love to have some of you guys call in and get in on this celebration, maybe not just for the Rays clinching a postseason berth for uh the back-to-back seasons for only the second time in franchise history, but the Lightning recently um getting a goal in overtime against the Islanders to punch their ticket to the Stanley Cup final against the Dallas Stars the first time the Lightning have made it this far since 2015 when they lose I believe in five or six games uh, to the Chicago Blackhawks so here's to hoping um, it goes a little bit better this time around also an NFL action uh, late in the fourth quarter it looks like it'll be the the Cleveland Browns um, even though I picked against them they're up 35 to 23 over the Bengals so it looks like uh, Baker Mayfield and company uh, got things turned around it looked like to be a pretty good showing in Cleveland for that Thursday night contest so maybe um, some some NFL stadiums will be having more and more fans as the season goes on but we we continue on with our coverage of the doubleheader for the race today we told you everything really that you needed to know about the 3-1 win uh, in game one Uh, Blake Snell decent outing 
Uh, could have challenged hitters more, but that's really been a common theme over the course of the season. He gets pulled early. I think he could have easily gone the seven uh, complete game and gotten the win. Instead, they uh, they uh, they look to Castillo, who pitches an inning and two thirds and throws thirty four times. So that's going to take him out of uh, commission for a while. And, and I also this close to the postseason, why are you using probably your second highest leverage reliever behind Nick Anderson? Uh, that much uh, cash seemingly has an answer for everything um, so especially on a night like this I'll choose uh, not to question him um, but you know it works out they get the win uh, but they need one more win uh, in order to punch their ticket to the postseason if they want to do it today and they do just that 10 to 6 over the Orioles I did not watch this game so I'm going to go off of uh, kind of the, the recap from from ESPN so I apologize if I'm not totally accurate on all my statements, but we'll go off the stats really as best as we can. It was Trevor Richards getting the start. He goes three and a third, four earned runs on five hits. He gets called up as the extra man has been in the alternate site in Port Charlotte um, ever since uh, Charlie Morton was able to return, which makes sense. And out of the pen, they use Thompson, Fairbanks, and Curtis. So Curtis was the man on the mound as they, they clinched the postseason. I'd imagine it would be Anderson just for baseball traditionalist's sake, but they don't always opt for that. I know they did that uh, last year when they were up sizably. Uh, they put Emilio Pagan on the mound, so who knows? Uh, I think it's more important to have Anderson ready, so not just, you know, you forget all the gimmicks and things like that. It's a different season. So Curtis, John Curtis, uh, kind of a similar story to Pagan, uh, is on the mound and, and closes out a game where uh, the Rays do win the postseason. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later because it is more big picture, big picture stuff. But uh, this year feels so much different uh, than last year in so many different ways. Uh, the lineup, uh, again, as I said, it makes sense that they changed um, a lot of men around in the outfield from left to right. It was a Rose Arena in left. Margot comes in to play center. Uh, Hunter Renfro makes his return in quite some time to play right field. And in the infield from third to first, Wendell at third. At shortstop, it was Willie Adamas playing both games at shortstop, albeit only 14 innings. But um, he, he's that young energizer bunny, and boy, did he come up big in game two. At second base, Mike Brasso. And playing first for the second game as well, Nate Lowe, who came back around nicely in game two. Uh, Kevin Smith did the catching, which makes sense. And the DH was um, Brandon Lau. So they end up having him in both games, but give him the, the basically the half game off is what they call it. In the DH spot and the way the lineup was structured, Arosa Reina led off, which it seems like something that they like to do. Hunter Renfro hits second, Brandon Lau third. Brasso did the cleanup duty. Um, then it was Adamas fifth. Uh, Nate Lowe, 6th, and then the seven, eight, nine of Margot, Kevin Smith, and Joy Wendell, which I like that a lot, uh, that bottom three. Uh, not as much Smith, but I like that you have Margot 7th and especially Wendell ninth. I talk about all that all, about that all the time. Get a guy that can get on base and turn back over to the top of the order. And they did that a couple times, and to his credit, Joy Wendell hitting, I believe, his second home run of the season actually his third so i apologize for that Uh, yeah so it's his third home run of the season joey wendell with some pop in the bat these days so that's certainly good to see they go five for eight with runners in scoring position i did catch the post game uh zoom room kind of stuff such a shame that it's not in the locker room with all the champagne and stuff but i understand uh mlb opting for safety first they have to make sure that the teams are are ready to complete the postseason or else all this uh was for not and you know that well that would be the worst possible scenario so they play it safe and um, I'm, I'm sure they'll in the hotel there's going to be the same old celebrations but for optics sake uh, you have to ban it in the MLB rule book um, so instead of uh, getting Kevin Cash and seeing a side of him that we don't normally see uh, celebrating we get the uh, kind of the coach speak in the zoom room but um, he was he was elated about a lot of things which was good to see not just the runner sitting and scoring position again a uh, five for eight uh, Smith gets a hit uh, Margot gets a hit uh, Damas with two um, and then Nate Lowe getting hit as well. The only man to not record a hit with runners in scoring position, Renfro, um, La- uh, Lowe, and Brasso. Um, so they did good in that department and only leave four men on base. So they pretty much finished what they started. And a big part of that um, was the long ball. They had um, a home run from Wendell, one from Adamas, and that was it. But they, they came in really big spots. Um, we'll go to the play-by-play first as I, as I kind of piece this together um, a little bit live on the air. Again, number to call if you want to call in to talk race, talk lightning, 877-566-1020. 
is the number to call. Top of the first, again, Trevor Richards on the mount. Um, Mullins reaches on a bunt single, and then he gets DJ Stewart to ground out, moves Mullins over, then a Mount Castle walk. So already, uh, Richards is getting into a little bit of trouble, but then gets Severino to ground into the double play. So one of the better hitters um, well, leaves some men on for the O's in the top of the first. Bottom of the first, a Zimmerman on for the O's. A Rosarena flies out, but then uh, Renfro gets hit by a pitch. Welcome back uh, to the lineup, buddy, getting hit by by one. Uh, it was, let's see, it was a 83-mile-an-hour curve that ran inside to him, so uh, that's not too bad. Uh, Brandon Lau walks, which puts a couple of men on. Brasso flies out to right, so, oh, what do you know? The return of the two-out Rays. It was Willie Adamas who goes 0-4 with four strikeouts in Game 1. What a comeback for him. 368 feet to left, the home run. Scores Renfro, scores Lau, and, of course, scores Adamas. And in the bottom of the first, it was 3 nothing Rays. Uh, and then, of course, Nate Lowe striking out with the bases empty. Top of the second, Cisco strikes out. But then uh, the O's start going with the long ball. Alberto, uh, 369 feet to left, gets them on the board, 3-1, uh, but then gets Ruiz and Hayes. Bottom of the second, uh, Margot lines out, Smith lines out, uh, Wendell hits a single, and then a Rosarena grounds out to end things. Top of the third, um, it was Richards getting Valeka and Mullins. Does walk DJ Stewart, and again, the O's, or, uh, they don't go deep, but they get extra bases. Mount Castle with an RBI double uh, to right to make it just 3-2 to two raise, and then Severino uh, struck out with the tying run at second to end the inning. Bottom of the third, it was led off by Hunter Renfro, who hit uh, a 389-foot uh, home run to left to make it 2-4 to four and extend the Rays' lead. And then uh, Brandon Lau strikes out, Brasso dinged by a pitch, and Adamas grinding into a double play. So uh, does, you know, uh, not such a great play there, but the home run was huge for him. And, and Willie Adamas was elated in the Zoom room, as was Kevin Cash about him. Um, a couple of quotes that I have about that. Willie Adamas saying that he almost felt like crying. Uh, he was in the midst of a 2-for-36 stretch which I believe is about uh, batting 080. So uh, he's been really bad as of late. Some of that is, you know, the home Willie has really struggled. Uh, you know, road Willie is, is much better on the road with the lighting and the trop. Who knows? That could be a little bit troubling for that three-game set. Uh, but then after that, it's going to be either in San Diego or um, Dodger Stadium. So uh, hopefully he'll play all right there. No, uh, neither stadium uh, he's totally familiar with. I believe he's played in both uh, last season. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. And then also from Kevin Cash uh, saying that, you know, you don't really see him express a lot of emotion. But when Trisha Whitaker asked him about that, um, you know, how good did it feel to see him hit that home run after the, the two for 36? And Kevin Cash said he was the second happiest person, uh, you know, behind Willie Adamas to see him hit the home run. So all good stuff. And uh, and, and something they talk about on the post game um, on Fox Sports Sun. And, you know, it's what makes Willie Adamas such a crucial part of this ball club. Um, a lot a lot of guys, when they're struggling at the plate, they'll take it into the field. And that's where you'll see errors and things like that. Uh, Adamas did have a, a little bit of a trouble shaking off the rust to start off the year, but he's been tremendous uh, at shortstop, pretty much the old Willie uh, that's been so good with the leather that we've known and, and come to love. And, and at no point during the season when he struggled with the bat, um, has he taken it out really to the field with him? He's always been that, that stable force in between second and third base and, of course, wherever they put him. Um, because of the shift um, so it's good to see him make things like that uh, you look back to last year he really caught fire in the month of September and carried it over with him I believe he hit home runs and back-to-back days in games three and four of the ALDS that helped propel uh, the race to a game five uh, where they end up losing but that that was huge for the race to, to win those games uh, in the trop and all those things like that I um, mean, to see Adamas, you know, the youngster coming up so big in the playoffs. So hopefully he's pulled for another one of those runs. And, and it gave the the Rays the early lead and allowed them uh, to hold on. And, you know, they ult- the, I think the Orioles did take the lead, but it allowed the race, uh, again, ultimately to go on to win and po- uh, clinch a postseason spot. So enough of all of that. Uh, the Orioles do tie it in the fourth and actually do take the lead. Uh, with Richard still on the mound, this is where really he got dinged up, but he did get to finish the inning, so good on him for that, I suppose. Uh, Cisco singles to right, then he gets Alberto to line out, uh, but then Rio Ruiz, 375 feet 
uh, to right and scored Cisco. Uh, that tied the game at four. Then Hayes struck out swinging, uh, but then a couple of men on with infield singles. Uh, Valeka reaches and also Mullins, uh, both on infield singles to put a couple of men on with two outs. And then DJ Stewart with a two RBI double uh, to deep right to make it six to four. And uh, he gets Mount Castle to strike out. So I guess uh, I am. Um, for the rest of 2020, Trevor Richards doesn't mean anything to the team, but I guess good that he gets to finish the fourth. Uh, bottom of the fourth, um, Zimmerman uh, has, has the last batter he faces. Uh, Nate Lowe singles to left, and then in comes Lakins. Um, but the Rays uh, do tie it up in this inning. Marco pops out. Smith strikes out. But again, the theme, the two-out Rays with Smith, uh, or I'm sorry, with, Lau, or with Lowe uh, standing at first. It was Joey Wendell. 399 feet to right, a home run that scored himself and also Nate Lowe and tied the game at six. A Rosarena doubles, Hunter Renfro works a walk, and another pitching change. Pitching change. Solcer comes on to face Lau, who pops him up um, and leaves a couple of men on in a tie game in the fourth um, of a seven-inning doubleheader game. Top of the fourth, uh, in comes Peter Fairbanks, gets Severino to strike out. Cisco hits a single, uh, then gets another strike out of Alberto, so it's a man on first with two outs. And then, what do you know, the infield singles continue. Ruiz gets one, uh, but then he gets Hayes to, to ground out to end things. So uh, Fairbanks, a, a little bit of a, a rough inning, but it gets out of it, scoreless. Bottom of the fifth, and the Rays, this is where they do their damage and take the lead and, again, ultimately punch their ticket to October baseball. Uh, Brasso with the leadoff walk, he steals second. Adamas reaches on an infield single, um, and then Brasso is, is safe at third on a throwing error. So all of a sudden, uh, you have runners on the corners with nobody out. Um, and then it was, um, it looks like, or that that was during the at bat to Willie Adamas, I guess. And then um, I think he gets on. There's an, an error with the page, um, so it looks like he must have have got on um, on base on first. And then Nate Low uh, singles that scores. Mike Brasso moves Adamas up. Uh, another pitching change. Uh, Tate comes in for Baltimore. Uh, Margot reached on a bunt single uh, that moves the runners over to second and third. So the bases are loaded, um, and they're up seven to six at that point. That single from Nate Lowe took the lead, uh, but then they were able to, uh, on three straight run-producing plays, able to extend their lead even further. Kevin Smith reaches on an infield single, so looks like the Orioles' defense is having a little bit of a, uh, a tough time in game two. That scored Adamas. Uh, Wendell hits a sacrifice fly that scores low, makes it a six, or I'm sorry, nine to six, and then a Rosarena with a sacrifice fly of his own uh, to score Margot, so ten to six, which would end up being the final score. Renfro strikes out, uh, uh, swinging to end that inning. Top of the six we go. Phillips comes in to play left field. Valleca flies out. Mullins grounds out. DJ Stewart strikes out. Uh, that was John Curtis on the mound. He would finish the game, uh, the sixth and seventh inning. The Rays go down one, two, three. Uh, Phillips for Baltimore strikes out the side. Lau, Brasso, Adamas. But they do head to the top of the seventh because I forget the Rays were the designated home team in this doubleheader. Although it was in Baltimore, that was because um, a game that was um, originally slated, it was a four-game set in the drop. I think it was the last of those four um, that was postponed. Uh, the players uh, were protesting it due to the, the social justice. Um, so, so they make it up in a doubleheader as part of five games in four days in Camden Yards. Um, but, you know, the race winning two, a uh, place where they don't usually win. They're one of the worst teams in the majors at playing at Camden Yards. Um, and, and to really sweep the doubleheader was huge for them, I think, too. Top of the seventh, Curtis still on. Uh, to, to close the game, and in some ways, the regular season, Mount Castle pops out to second. Severino lines out, uh, so two outs, bases empty. Cisco gets hit by a pitch, uh, moves to second on the classic fielder's indifference. Alberto safe at, at first on an error, uh, charged to Adamas, uh, so he does make a mistake, and then now he gets to second on fielder's indifference, and then Rio Ruiz grounds out to second base to end. Uh, the inning, and again, as I said, some wise the regular season. Really, the only thing left to, for the Rays to do over the next couple of a series, there's not a lot of baseball uh, left to be played. We look at the upcoming schedule. They've got three games um, you know, uh, in three days, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday slate in Baltimore. 
Uh, but then after that, they head up to New York to play the Mets for three games. Uh, it looks like they'll face DeGrom, um, who left after two innings and a start last night. But it just looks like uh, some sort of tweak on a, on a hamstring, I believe. But looks like he'll be fine. They're going to need him for a, a postseason push. They did get another win over the Phillies, so the Mets are still in the mix. And the meaning behind that is um, they're going to be playing their hardest uh, to win those games against the Rays. And I think same for the Phillies when they return home for the final three games. Um, I believe they've secured the second spot in the NL East as of now, but nothing is safe, um, especially with those games that the Mets have been winning against them lately. Who really knows? Um, so nine games left, three against the O's, three against the Mets, three against the Phillies, only three of those at home, the final three against Philadelphia. So who knows how the season is, is going to shake out. If I'm not mistaken, the magic number to win the division, so that would be combined race wins and Yankees losses, is seven with about nine to play for both teams. But the Yankees, who have won seven straight, uh, it doesn't look like they are going to relinquish anything. So, um, But the Rays, they're in the driver's seat. Again, that's something we talk about in sports so often. They control their own destiny. Um, so, uh, not so much for really the the uh, the, the seeding, I suppose. Uh, the matchups is going to be tough. A three game set is going to be a crapshoot. I think even if the Rays kind of stumble to the finish line, they're most likely going to be playing that series in Tropicana Field, um, and that that's a certain uh, certainly a good conversation to have as well. I think uh, in a three game set in the postseason, where you know, two wins out of three will will take it for you. I think the Rays have a, a home field. Um, a home field advantage unlike no other, especially if they're playing a team from the Central or the West and the American League that has not played in the Tropicana field this year, of course, with the East staying together, the Central and the West. Um, and, and behind that, uh, if you're not already familiar with the concept, Tropicana Field is not an easy place to play baseball. Um, if you're not used to playing there, the lighting is weird. Um, it's hard to track a white baseball in a white dome. Um, especially with said lighting, the turf is different. It's not grass. The ball has a different bounce that you play it off of, um, all things like that. And the Rays playing half their games every year, uh, they hold that advantage because they know how to play there. And so often we see, um, comes to mind, there was a couple times in that first, um, uh, or the second series of the year, that two game set against Atlanta that came in late July. Um, there was a couple of plays in the outfield for the Braves that were just simply missed. Would have routine plays that would have been made in the other 29 ballparks, most likely. Uh, but in Tropicana Field, if you're not used to playing there, it's tough. So I think more so than the division, the division really is just for bragging rights. And I think maybe for ticket sales, you get to hang the banger. The I said it again, you get to hang the banger, no, the banner. Um, and it's something you get to put in the program, uh, 2020 AL East champs. That's all fine and great. I think it's most important for them to to get at least one of the top four seeds in the eight teams that are making the postseason. Again, they clinch their spot. Uh, but they're going to have to win a handful more games if they want to host that opening three-game set. And even if it is in the trop, it's a crapshoot. We look at the teams that they'll be playing right now. It's probably going to be one of the two wild cards, um, that, which right now is either the Toronto Blue Jays, who have played the Rays oh so tough this year, as you know if you follow the team, and the Cleveland Indians, who the Rays have faced once in the postseason in the 2013 wild card game in Cleveland. Um, a, a gem, I believe, from Alex Cobb, and the Rays going to win that. Um, then they lose the ALDS to the Red Sox. That was 2013. So a little bit of history between them. Who knows where that'll go? Uh, but uh, it'll change a little bit with the seeding. But I think we're coming down to down to the final stretch now, where we have a pretty pretty good idea of where things sit. Um, it looks like yeah, the Yankees are probably going to get second place in the division. So that'll put the the Jays uh, vying for a wild card, and they'll probably get it. And in the Central, it looks like, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, I don't know the order, seven or eight, the order doesn't matter, but it looks like the wild card teams will be the Blue Jays or the Indians. So if you're kind of curious to how uh, maybe the Rays would look in that three game set, I would point you to those directions and take a look at those rosters. We won't do that now. I want to wait until maybe we have a little bit closer of an idea of who they'll be playing, but. Um, I, I think the clear answer is they would line up a bit better against Cleveland. Uh, the starting pitching certainly is there for them, and I guess I'll, I'll take a little bit of a peek um, but before we go ahead and take a break. But, um, you know, Shane Bieber got his eighth win. He'll probably secure the American League Cy Young. Uh, Adam Savali has been great, the starting pitcher. Uh, Zach Plesak, Adam Plutko, they have, um, well, Plutko's a reliever, but Plesak, the starter. So you look at the big three that they have, uh, if, if let's say the Rays face Cleveland, Shane Bieber, again, the American League Cy Young Award winner, it's safe to say they're going to throw you at him in game one. Um, and again, 
like we saw with against Garrett Cole last year, let's say uh, this this year's team is different, but if you only get a run over eight innings, that, that flips the series. Adam Savali has been pretty good, uh, taking a peek at his record in ERA because um, I'm not too familiar with him, and then Zach Plesak as well. Uh, Savali is 3-5 and five with a 380 ERA. Um, so he's been he's been good, but I know that he's gone deep into some ball games. And then uh, Adam Plutko, uh, who is right now, um, well, he's or I'm sorry, uh, Zach Plesak. I know I keep missing that up. Um, Zach Plesak is three and two on the year with a 2.20 earn round average. So um, at least the first two, and again in a three game series, uh, a couple of good starting pitchers can really shorten things. Um, but then of course the other side of that coin is the Rays are going to be able to shorten it um, in their own way. I think I w- do not be surprised if Glasnow goes six or seven strong in game one. I think he would be your game one starter. Um, and then I think Snell this year, I think just whatever reason, coach Kyle Snyder, the pitching coach can't get him out of the mindset. Snell is determined to get on the mound and strike everybody out. And he's going to throw a lot of non-competitive pitches because he doesn't want the barrel touching the baseball. He wants you to wave and miss at every pitch. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, the Indians with their coaching staff, that's so good. Terry Francona and company, uh, where Kevin Cash learned from, in fact, in Boston, and in, in Cleveland a little bit as well. Uh, they're going to know that about Snell, and uh, who knows how that outing goes. And then in Game 3, um, they're going to have to get creative, I would say. Morton, who knows if he'll be ready, but he's not the same Morton he was a year ago, although he's looked decent the last couple of times out, but you don't really know what you're getting from him. Maybe a tandem up and go him and Yarbrough. Um, All-out bullpen day. Um, I... You want to avoid a game three. I think it's inevitable, though, in a postseason. A team's not going to lay down and lose the first two um, unless they just have a really time, a hard time adjusting to the trop or, or whatever. The Rays uh, just catch fire or something like that. And then uh, you, you look at the Blue Jays, and we're familiar with them. We know um, all the bats and the things that they can do um, You know, against the, the, the Rays um, this season. Uh, I don't know the exact record, but it's it's not been uh, the Rays have gotten wins, but they've all been close, and it seems like they always come down um, to the wire. Uh, they they've made a lot of additions at the trade deadline, which is a little bit concerning. Uh, young guys that play loose, and that's uh, what the Rays were last year, and uh, not a team certainly you want to face. I mean, uh, Hinjin Ryu, a National League Cy Young contender a year ago, you're gonna they're gonna throw him in, in game one. Um, they've got, you know, a couple of other starters, you know, pick one, Robbie Ray, Tanner Roark, Ross Stripling, Tawan Walker. So they've got a lot of guys uh, that are pretty decent starters. And then you look at the bats. We know um, from from that Bo Bichette, Kevin Biggio, Vladdy Jr., who's not so great this year. Uh, but, you know, top to bottom, they secure Jonathan VR at the trade deadline, the switch hitter, um, you know, who's who's pretty good. And the race have faced him in Baltimore um, and also Miami this season. You know, Randall Gritchick, uh, Gurriel Jr., T. Oscar Hernandez. They've got really good at bat, uh, really good bats that can hit a home run at any moment. That's kind of how they're built. Uh, but guys like Biggio, um, who draw just such good at bats and are so hard to beat. Um, and then you look at the catchers as well. Danny Jansen, it looks like. Uh, the the other one um, has been sent down of some sort, um, but Danny Jensen is a really hard catcher to run on. Um, and with the Rays doing what they've done with uh, the base path and the stolen bases, that that can uh, make it a lot more difficult as well. So, um, just breaking it down a little bit, um, you know, we'll we'll talk about it of course in depth. Um, you know, as the as the regular season trudges on, and hopefully we'll be talking at some point about the the Rays clinching the American League East. Who knows if they'll get to that point or not? Uh, so. Uh, again, just kind of a, a, a bridge that they'll have to cross and uh, when we get to it. So at 11.54, we're going to take a short break. I'm not sure how much we have left to discuss, but we'll, we'll come back and maybe take some of your calls at 877-566-1020. Uh, again, we'll take a short break, and we'll be right back. Hey, sports fans. William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember... You can call us at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway, when all that's said and done, please stay tuned for William's World Famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit whbcstream.com, and thanks again for listening in.
HBC and at 1156 we return to the William Hain show uh, over the next maybe 10 minutes or so we'll take your calls at 877-566-1020 if not uh, we'll talk a little bit of sports um, basketball today was the Miami Heat 106 to 10 win over the Boston Red Sox or uh, the <laughs> get all the sports confused the Heat over the Celtics 106 to 101 so the Heat um, after a thrilling game one, they now hold a two games to none series lead. And how good has Jimmy Butler and company been uh, for the Heat? We'll just take a, a little bit of a peek at that box score, um, and then at the end of the show, we'll preview tomorrow's game against the, the Orioles and, and get off the air. Um, we look at points for the Heat. It was Butler. He only had 14. Uh, the leader in points it was uh, Goran Dragic, uh, the, the point guard, the 34 year old, or, or not not 34 year old, but but um, 34 minutes. Excuse me. Um, but he is he's he is 34 years old. So uh, what do you know? I was I was right uh, all the way through. Um, that's kind of funny actually that it worked out that way. Uh, but you know the Celtics, a team that I mean they they've been there in the postseason the past couple of years and they just really haven't been able to get there. Um, it seems in the Eastern Conference Final is always the roadblock that they can't cross and, and a Heat team that's really caught fire. I mean they've got good guys on the bench as well. You know Alinek. Iguodala, Derek Jones Jr. as well. So they're a really complete team. Adebayo has come in, into his own. He scores 21, um, you know, and gets 10 rebounds as well. So a double double for him. Um, so the Heat with uh, c- uh, command and control in that series, and also as we know, the Clippers who blew a 3-1 lead to the Nuggets. And I wasn't aware that the Nuggets came back from two 3-1 deficits this postseason. So uh, they're red hot, and they're going to face uh, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and the rest of the Los Angeles Lakers in the Western Conference Finals to probably play the Miami Heat. And how interesting would that be um, if uh, LeBron James faces his his former Miami Heat? Um, in the finals that would be pretty interesting indeed or potentially Boston his former nemesis um, all those years when he was uh, for the the Cleveland Cavaliers so uh, narratives any which way that you want to slice it and uh, Thursday night football I'm sure none of you were actually able to watch it uh, because it's part of the NFL's whatever kind of movement uh, the first or the week two Thursday night football game is always on NFL Network and it's exclusive and no one can get it and that's fine. I didn't get it. I'll, I'll probably catch it on Game Pass. Maybe uh, neither of these teams really you know excite me. The Bucks won't face either of them. Uh, but it was the the Cleveland Browns thirty five to thirty over the Cleveland uh, or over the Cincinnati Bengals and actually I did have the Bengals uh, plus six. So I had you like that backdoor cover. Um, they they came back I think in garbage time. So. Um, I actually did end up nailing the pick against the spread, um, so so there I go. I, if you had that ticket, um, uh, you know, had the money in it on accounts to me, uh, you're welcome. You can go and cash it. And wow, uh, talk about a Bengals team that is throwing Burrow to the wolves. He threw the ball 61 times, which I have to imagine is probably up there um, with the records for a rookie quarterback. That'll obviously be the narrative tomorrow. And what a game he had in a loss. 37 of 61, 316 passing yards, five yards per attempt, which, eh, okay. Three touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, great. And then you look at the running game, and you're getting three yards to carry from Mixon uh, on 16 touches and 2.7 from, um, oh, from Burrow. So they really didn't have any running game going. About 50 yards total um, from the running back. So, of course, with the offensive line being the way that it is, uh, that makes sense. Uh, Burrow did fumble twice and did lose it once. That was on a strip sack for Miles Garrett. Interestingly enough, Miles Garrett, who contemplated, I guess, um, retiring after that weird fiasco where he basically just clocks Mason Rudolph with his helmet. So, uh, but he's come on stronger than ever, I guess, 
um, in in the right ways, hopefully. And then for the victorious Cleveland Browns, they take a much wow, they take a much much different approach. Uh, Baker Mayfield, the game manager, if you will, he didn't get sacked either. Uh, by the way, Burrow got sacked three times, including a strip sack. But Mayfield, 16 of 23, 219 yards. So that's 10 yards per attempt, much better in that category. Two touchdowns, one pick. Um, and then you look at the running game. That really, uh, they had more rushing than passing yards. Something the the um, uh, the Bengals certainly can't say. Nick Chubb, 22 carries, 124 yards. So. Uh, it's about five and a half yards a carry and two touchdowns. And then Kareem Hunt as well, uh, 10 carries, 86 yards. He averages almost nine yards a carry uh, and scores a touchdown. They both had pretty long runs. Hunt a run at 33 and Chubb a long of 26. So uh, Cleveland, I guess that's where they're going to be at their best. They certainly couldn't establish the run against a really good Ravens defense last week, but against a crummy one in the Bengals, they're able to do so and kind of get their game plan. O- Odell catches a touchdown, so... So there you go, and uh, although the Browns almost blew it at the end, the same old Browns um, in front of their faithful in Cleveland, again, had a pretty decent amount of fans. They advanced to 1-1 one and one, um, on the season and dropped the Cincinnati Bengals to 0-2. Oh um, so, you know, the Bengals we knew weren't going to be in contention this year. They had the worst record last year for a reason. Uh, but Burrow throwing 61 times in his second career game with no preseason Yikes! I would imagine that the uh, the youngster head coach, um, whose name is eluding me right now, um, I would imagine he's going to be catching a little bit of heat for that. I mean, it did work out: three hundred fifteen yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Um, I, I guess so. I mean, it, it's hard to say uh, with things like that, but uh, I guess Bengals may be a team to keep an eye on. The Browns stay in the mix as well. So uh, we'll talk more football tomorrow. We'll give you all our picks against the spread and also a real uh, proper Bucks v Panthers. Uh, preview there's some kind of weird stuff going on this week um, about uh, Arians in the post game on Sunday and then on Monday saying that Brady missed a couple of throws and how dare you um, say anything like that and then um, you know the Boston media was coming after Arians a lot of weird stuff and then you know Brady came out rightfully so and said look Arians is the coach I'm the player Uh, if he says I'm in the wrong uh, you know, then so be it. Uh, I, I, it's hard to deny that he was in the wrong on some of those throws, especially after Arians clarified that you know the wide receiver Evans was was running the route as the way it was intended to be run and the way that he was coached to do so. So um, that was maybe Brady reverting back to whatever he was used to in the New England offense, and that that was the big talking point going into the season. How was he going to adjust? Um, into a new season they did adapt kind of some of the stuff to fit Brady although not a lot of check down to the running back that we saw time and time again especially last year um, Brady did hit the deep throws at times but um, I'll give it to you give it to him his receivers missed a couple of plays especially Mike Evans had a really tough game but he's dealing with some sort of uh, soft tissue muscle issue but it looks like he's good to go again for week two uh, but they're certainly going to need him 100% at some point this year um, if they want to put up more points, the defense I thought looked really good, but but gave up uh, over 30 points to the Saints. So what can you do about that? But they did shut down the, the top weapons. Uh, Alvin Kamara basically gave them nothing, uh, and neither did Michael Thomas, who led or who broke the NFL record for receptions in a season, held them to just three catches and 17 yards. So a defense that knows what they're doing, and I, I expect them as they did last year to really shut down Christian McCaffrey. Um, I know the the Panthers offense has moved off that a little bit. He didn't really carry the the load against the Raiders. It was more of the the passing game and Teddy Bridgewater doing some certain certain things. So it's a better Panthers team certainly than than the Bucks faced a season ago. But uh, I think I would imagine we'll we'll check on the line right now as it sits. I know I'll, I'll give you the 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 exact picks tomorrow, but I'm just curious to see. Uh, for conversation's sake, it looks like um, it's Tampa Bay, as you would expect, favored by eight and a half. I was going to guess maybe nine or ten. And uh, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, but I, I do do picks against the spread, I would I would be inclined to take Tampa Bay. I think it would be probably a 14 point win or so. Um, of course, the Bucks. You like to think that it's a different Bucks team with Tom Brady, but Bucks gonna buck, and they always play close games, whether they win or lose. Um, so I, I don't know. So I guess that is a little bit treacherous 
Honestly, to tell you the truth, if I was a betting man, I wouldn't bet the game, but I, I'll give you a sneak peek. I'll, I'll probably end up uh, picking Tampa Bay minus eight and a half, but some of that, um, you know, the little bit of the of the home field uh, or the, the home team kind of bias, what have you. So um, we'll, we'll kind of shelf that for tomorrow. And to wrap up the show, I just wanted to preview tomorrow's contest against the Orioles. Oh, getting started at 735 Eastern time for whatever reason that's been the games in, in Camden Yards this year. So I will be on the air. Oh, man, probably at about 10, 1030, whenever that game wraps, whenever the final out, and we'll probably be pretty quick in doing so. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, we that's kind of what we've been doing this year, kind of some race, post-game stuff. Um, after the show, we'll take your calls and all the, that stuff. I would recommend following the Twitter at WHBC Stream. I post the link to the show pretty much everywhere, uh, the Rays Discord, the Rays Twitter, the Rays uh, Reddit, all that kind of stuff. But uh, if you want to go straight to the source, you'll get it as soon as it goes live. Um, so you'll catch kind of the opening monologue, opening statements for me. Uh, at WHPC Stream is the Twitter. Um, but again, 735, uh, first pitch tomorrow, Rays and Orioles. Um, I wouldn't imagine too much of a hangover from the Rays. I, there's a good chance they could be physically hungover, um, clinching the, the playoff spot, but but who knows? I mean, an Orioles team, that, that I think that's kind of laying down at this point in the season. They have some young guys who can fight, but uh, sweeping a doubleheader is usually a good indication of how the teams match up. Uh, Tyler Glass now on the bump, which I think is big um, with the way the bullpen is right now, um, pitching two games, uh, but they'll, they'll probably make some sort of shuffle. Glass now in the season, though, is 3-1 and one with a 4.47 ERA, and boy, was he good his last time out. He's pitched 46 innings, which, wow, uh, it seems like not too long ago he was still getting stretched out. And then uh, going for the O's. We've seen him once this year, the former Ray, Alex Cobb, who's having not such a great year at 1-4 and four with a 5.03 ERA. Um, uh, for Tyler Glasnow, his last time out, that came against the Boston Red Sox, and he went seven innings strong. Uh, did give up a couple of long balls, which um, was, was you know kind of a, a detractor to his experience. Um, so it, he went seven innings, gave up four earned runs on six hits, but it, I think it was two, two runs, and then he gave up, I want to say, back-to-back solo shots or something like that. Uh, so ended up being four earned runs on only six hits. One walk, which is also good. Seven strikeouts, 102 pitches. So uh, he's going to be able to go as deep as they need him to. Every time I predict a guy will go seven, they, they'll go five and a third. Um, so, I mean, six or seven uh, is what you would expect, although you never know. He had a rough timeout against the Orioles. Uh, he's faced him twice, and boy, oh boy, was he good the second time around. The first time um, on August the 1st, so maybe you throw it out, four and two-thirds. Um, uh, but the second time out, boy, oh boy, August uh, 25th. He went seven innings strong again. Uh, the only other time he's gone seven innings, two run ball on five hits. Uh, gave up a home run in that one as well. So and only uh, once again only a walk and a season high thirteen strikeout. So he could be poised for a pretty good game, and we would love to see that. Um, in Alex Cobb's case, we look at uh, his last start came against the New York Yankees, um, where he went four innings um, in the Bronx, and then I believe that he's faced uh, the Rays. Uh, a uh, once this year his last time out against the Yankees um, was four innings five runs on seven hits I gave up three home runs wow a walk five strikeouts only threw 60 pitches that was in a seven inning uh, d- uh, double header though so make of that what you will and his only time against the Rays came on July 31st so not s- super indicative either but did go four innings two earned runs on four hits um, three walks two strikeouts so let's take a look let's take a peek at the lineup that they uh, put against um, uh, put against him the last time around. It was G-Man Choi to lead off, which we won't see as he's going to miss the rest of the season. Zanino as well, so we won't see. But other guys, Brandon Lau batted second, Adamas third, Sutsugo did clean up, so that was part of that kind of early season experimenting. Uh, then Yandy Diaz, who's out, so I don't know. Not I, I guess I, I forget kind of how different this roster has uh, it's taken on different forms. Um, so, so who really knows? Especially with a doubleheader, it's basically I would imagine not as much righty lefty, but but who's feeling the most light on their feet and ready to go? Um, and then out of the bullpen, again, really crapshoot. I will give you one surprise pick. Well, not surprise, but Aaron Sleggers, who hasn't gone in a while. I believe it was Monday or so. He went three innings. Um, so, so they can he can get some length, or maybe just even an inning or two behind Glass. Now, I can't imagine he's going to make the postseason roster just with the way that the guys that they have. I don't know. I I can't imagine that they're going to make a, a late push for for Alvarado, but you never know. They haven't ruled it out. 
Um, so Slager's at some point behind Glass now, I would expect. Nick Anderson should be ready. Castillo will not. Curtis will not. Drake will come on. I would probably uh, guarantee that. So they've got guys that can come on. In fact, you know, Fairbanks is probably out. Uh, maybe Thompson as well. Um, you know, but they also have Sheriff. So I'll give you a couple of guys. Slager's, Sheriff, Anderson to close out the game. And then Oliver Drake, uh, who didn't look so good the last time around. But hopefully um, we'll see him do some things. Um, so, uh, we're going to wrap up the show there. Got through the hour. Didn't talk as much lightning as I would have, would have liked. We couldn't get Aaron, uh, uh, couldn't track him down. So maybe, uh, on tomorrow's show, we'll, we'll have a, a kind of proper lightning celebration. And we look forward to having all you guys on the program tomorrow as a race post game show on a Friday night. Well, also a football Friday prep you for the Bucks and the rest of the NFL. So that'll be an exciting show as was tonight. The lightning, we called it live. They're going to the Stanley cup final, the Rays. They're going to the uh, postseason and playing October baseball. So all great things there and great things on the horizon, no doubt. We look forward to covering it uh, in the future. And as always, we'll talk to you tomorrow. HBC.